Hey there, welcome to First Look. So this is take two for me today. I just tried to post this and YouTube crashed right in the middle of what I was doing. I don't really know what that means. It just means that like 22 minutes into the video, it just stopped. So I'm trying this a different way and hopefully it works this time. Um, but welcome to First Look. I'm at home today because uh, it's chilly and uh, I needed coffee and I can't, uh, you know, sit here with coffee and in, or walk and do all that business with you outside. And so I just decided to, to do it like this today. But it's a good week because it's a passage that is fascinating um, and it's on a, a really interesting part of the liturgical year. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the end of the church calendar, and this week is Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King Sunday, um, uh, which allows us and to think about Jesus from a very particular perspective. And that is either one that we are, you know, very familiar with and very comfortable with and um, really speaks to our heart, or maybe it's a bit of a challenge, and this is what I mean. So I think whenever you or I think about our faith, we tend to think about it, Jesus in particular, from one or two different angles. Either A, as a sort of transcendent figure, right? One who is, um, you know, creator of all and savior of all and you know, the, the king of our salvation. And we think about, um, you know, kind of a, something that will um, fulfill a promise for all eternity. You know, think about Jesus, like sin and salvation and something kind of bigger, right? Bigger than us, bigger than our existence. That's the transcendent view of Christ. But then for some of us, we tend to approach Jesus uh, with more of an on-the-ground kind of understanding, more existential. So Jesus is our, our teacher, our friend, our guide. Uh, teacher is, or, uh, Jesus is our sibling. Um, Jesus is one who sits with the poor and the oppressed and, and you know, is an advocate for justice. You know, their sort of grassroots Jesus. Um, and that Jesus is familiar to us. It could be both. It could be something in between. But my guess is that for all of us, when our initial concept of Jesus, or the one we latch on to most naturally, is probably one or the other. Uh, this week in particular asks us to look at the transcendent. Now, we try to make that as... Uh, relatable as possible, but that's that's the viewpoint. Because, you know, we're going to start the year, you know, Advent in December starts the year, and we start with making that mental transition, right? God uh, incarnate. So coming to earth, you know, that, that concept, that something that feels larger than life, literally, you know, in a manger. So that's the mental transition that we make. Um, but the, so the year ends with something bigger and then begins with um, this transition into something more tangible. Okay. So the story that is used in this particular year happens to be a parable that we know pretty well. Um, so the end of Matthew 25 is a text that we use in, in many different contexts uh, to talk about what it means to be a person of faith. And, um, and so this particular week, we look at it through this transcendent lens. So you know this text. Um, this is Matthew 20, again, 25 verses uh, 31 through 46. Um, we sometimes it's the uh, we talk about the the sheep and the goats, uh, but this NRSV version that I'm using 
um, the subtitle of this section is The Judgment of the Nations. So we can look at this passage either from a strictly individual kind of perspective, and we'll read it in a second, and you can kind of see what I mean, or from a more social, um, societal standpoint. All right. Let me remind you of what the passage says, and then we can get more into how we understand it or the ways we can understand it. All right. So starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink and I was a stranger and you welcomed me in and I was naked and you gave me clothing and I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that you we saw you sick, or in prison, or visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You probably know that text well. And as I said, many times we read it from a very individual perspective. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's just true that we often talk about it in those terms. Um, but again, this, the, the subheading, at least in my uh, version, says the judgment of the nations. Nations will be judged. Um, so the, the people who put the, the, these versions of Scripture together were thinking about them collectively as well. So we can look at that individually and collectively, and that there's some different uh, perspectives we can kind of... Um, glean from that. So thinking about it individually in that kind of classic sense is that that kind of um, persuades my action. Um, what does it mean to live faithfully? What does it mean to do that? But then it also makes me think about salvation. Now, um, the warning I guess I'll give for this text and for any text for that matter is not to read things in isolation. Uh, scripture can get warped. Scripture can get manipulated, weaponized whenever we um, use it for a particular perspective. Um, and we think about it more in isolation. Um, so if you read in isolation, uh, this might certainly give you the, the um, perspective that well, I have to earn, um, if I make enough points, if I do enough things, then I get to go to heaven. Like, this is, this is, but you and I know from scripture interpreting itself that, that we, we shouldn't read salvation like that, right? These, uh, these are reflections of who we are. Um, because as you notice, the righteous 
didn't even notice that they were doing those things. Lord, when, when did we do all that? We were just out here living our lives. And Jesus was like, oh, do you remember when you just did that for other people? Yeah, that's that was you doing it for me. That there's a certain um, natural response of those who follow Christ, right? And that, that's the implication there. So uh, we look at it individually, and it can lead us to righteous action, but it, it, I think that there's something broader that we're missing if we only look at it from that, from that view. And so if we step back from the passage for a moment and look at it as the, the uh, subtitle suggests, the judgment of the nations, then we start to look at that from a more societal standpoint. Now, that doesn't have to be a literal nation, but um, a society, us as a yins, you know, the, the collective yins. And so uh, when we start to look at it that way, then you start to think about, well, how do we do that? How are we those who are um, clothing people or feeding people or um, healing people from a societal standpoint? Are we doing that or are we not doing that? Are we kind of doing that, but only some? Um, do some of the people get those things and some of them don't? And why? And so handling that from a societal standpoint is more than just my individual action, right? Uh, donating to a food driver or visiting someone who's sick. Those are wonderful things to do individually. Um, but what does that mean for us collectively? You know, how do we start to address those things? Feeding and healing, you know, people caring for those who are in prison, etc. cetera. Um, well, we do that through uh, who we put into um, public office and, and, and what laws we advocate for and, um, you know, how we use our voice and those types of things. Um, those are the things, you know, the, what we demand as a society leads us in the directions that, you know, are faithful to this or not. And so we can look at that from that perspective. Um, and so, you know, when especially, I think this is a, a wonderfully in interesting passage to be looking at the week after Thanksgiving, the week before Advent, when we start to think about um, the uh, incarnation of Jesus, uh, why he is here, uh, and, you know, ultimately the ways that that Christ is leading us from individual and social kind of um, perspective. So then uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of mention when it comes to this passage is the ways that we read it. And if you remember a second ago, I was advocating for making sure you're reading things in context. And so I think we should also read this passage in context. Now, this parable in this chapter, Matthew 25, is the third parable in a row. Now, it could have been that Jesus was out somewhere and spoke all three parables right in a row. And we're going to read, we're going to look at the other two parables in a second. Just, um, uh, it could have been that he set up these three parables all in a row, or it could have been that the authors of Matthew put them all in a row intentionally for us to pay attention to and learn from. So here are the parables. If you pause or whatever and go back and look at uh, Matthew 25, the beginning of Matthew 25, the first 13 verses is the parable of the 10 bridesmaids. The uh, parable in the middle, 14 through 20, 30 through 30, is uh, the parable of the talents. And then there's ours, the judgment of the nations. Now, the talents parable is the one that I could have uh, written a sermon on this, just yesterday. Instead, I did Zephaniah, but those were paired together. Because if you get Zephaniah, you have to preach Zephaniah. Anyway, so uh, just think about that in context. It's a it's meant to kind of be one that holds us accountable as a kind of a judging uh, kind of a parable. So these, the first two parables 
uh, here's the synopsis. The parable of the bridesmaids is basically like they had lamps and uh, half of the bridesmaids thought to bring oil and half of them didn't. And so the ones who brought extra oil are wise and the ones who didn't bring extra oil are foolish. And, um, and uh, what happens at the end of the story is that they're waiting for the bridegroom. The bridegroom is late. Um, some of them have extra oil and so they're ready and they can they get into the gate and the other ones don't have it and they're um they're they're told well we can't give you any of our oil go buy it from someone and they're like well if all the stores are closed and they're like well, I can do. and so they're left out in the cold and the other ones come in and it's a story that talks about the you know being prepared uh, but those who just who didn't have are out and then there's the, the next parable, and it's the parable of the talents. And if you remember this parable, it's um, there's a uh, landowner who has three slaves, and um, they're all given a certain sum of money and said to you know take care of it while the slave owner is gone, while the landowner is gone and then returns. So um, the first two invested and make more money for the landowner, and the third one doesn't do that and buries it in the ground. And the landowner comes back and praises the first two for making him more money, and the third one uh, is like, well, what, why didn't you do anything? And, he's, and the third one says, well, yeah, I know that you're um, you know, a cruel man, and I was fearful of you, and so I just didn't want to lose it, and I buried it in the ground. And the landowner doesn't refute that. He says, well, yeah, but you should have done something. And uh, so, you know, you're out of luck. Um, so the first two get praised and the third one does not. And then we go to this parable of judgment of the nations, sheep and the goats. So what do we do with those parables? Because on their face, they make you want to be prepared and they make you want to um, invest in what you have been given so that you can, you know, do well for the one who gave you. And on, on one face, that makes sense. I, I think I understand the parable from parables from that perspective. Uh, but then there's also this other way of understanding the parables that I think gets teased out a little bit when we read it with the third one, the one with the judgment of the nations, the sheep and the goats. Because the, the last parable, the third parable that we read a little bit ago, when did you clothe me, you know, when did we clothe you, when did we feed you, when did we care for you, etc., cetera, um, advocates for empathy, advocates for caring for those who have not been cared for by society, who, you know, who have either by their own um, ignorance or own, um, you know, wrongdoing or, or, or just bad luck or circumstances or whatever, don't have anything. They're left out. They're the ones, they're the other. They're the stranger, right? So when, we, when you think about that third parable, it makes you think about the first two differently. Yes, the bridesmaids who didn't have extra oil didn't have any. That, but then they get left out in the cold and there's no one to care for them. And their biggest sin was not being prepared. And then the second one, um, yes, the, 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 that third slave didn't invest the money for the cruel landowner. Um, and, and, but his biggest sin is fear. And so then you have this third parable that talks about, you know, what we should be doing as nations or as individuals um, to be faithful. And it's looking out for the poor and the stranger and the ill and the forgotten, right? And so it makes you think, well, what is the kingdom of God like? Who are all these players in these, in these uh, parables? It makes me think, from at least one perspective, that the first two are examples of how far too often society looks, and the third one is how we get out. 
and so the again it's an advocacy from my perspective of, of how we um, how the kingdom of God is supposed to work the first two kind of are very practical ways of understanding society as it is hey be prepared hey you know know how to play the game like the first two slaves in the second parable knew how to play the game they invested they were wise they were they were good money managers and they made someone else a rich man who more money good for them and so they knew how to play the game and the the first parable uh, you know was an, an advocacy to, to be prepared you know to be astute um, but what happens if just you didn't you know it's, it wasn't like the they were you know they didn't dump the extra oil or sell it for you know something frivolous they just didn't think to bring it they assumed that the bridegroom would be on time and he wasn't um, and the third parable kind of works out maybe what should have happened in the other ones at least that's the way that i read it collectively because again i'm advocating for the fact that scripture interprets itself and so the the parable when we start to look at it um the, the third parable for this week starts to look very differently whenever we look at it from this sort of collective bigger like step back from it kind of thing because you know it's a it's a wonderful way of us advocating for individual righteous action for sure go and clothe the hungry go and you know clothe the hungry clothe the naked feed the hungry care for the sick and those in prison do all those things individually like please go i i um we encourage all of that but then also step back from it and look at hey what should the kingdom of god look like because the first two you know kind of give us a sense of the way society is and how to navigate it how to be good in the system that we have and the third one advocates for something else which i think is uh if we talk about the reign of christ how is the reign of christ different than the reign of people I have a feeling that that's, that's what we're supposed to be thinking through. Now, you could read these parables and be like, Ben, you are, you're out in left field, man. Uh, and that's fine. Let's talk about that. But I have a, a fairly decent feeling that that's, we're going to be talking through the way all these things connect because they're important. The way we interpret, interpret scripture is important. Um, the goals that we apply to scripture are important. And they're all, every scripture that we read is worth reading more than just whatever face value or whatever someone else tells you to look at it. And again, please, for the love of all that is pure and holy, do not just listen to what I have to say about anything. Because uh, I am who I am. And my advice would be to, at any time, talk to someone else that you think of as smart. And if you say, hey, here's something Ben said, my pastor said, in a sermon or in this, this video series he does or in conversation or in a book study or whatever, what do you, other person I trust, think about it? And they might, you know, you might get another perspective that I'm missing. Um, they might give you some something to work with that I, I haven't really paid attention to. And that that's what you're supposed to do. That's what educational discipleship is supposed to lead us to. It's supposed to lead us to how we disciple and how we care for uh, people from a social standpoint. Um, so I, I look forward to hearing what you think and what you, what you have to say about it. But... Um, that's that's this last parable in a nutshell and again that's how i think it leads us to understanding the kingship of jesus by getting us to understanding all of these lessons and how they apply to a world that jesus is going to make new
So that's what I got for you this week. Okay. That was, again, that was take two because the first time I did this, I was literally like 22 minutes in and the thing just shut down. So that's fun. All right. Go get ready for Thanksgiving. Go do whatever you're going to do. Uh, or maybe you're listening to this in the car. I would love to know if you all ever think of it. Tell me how you consume this um, this little thing that I do. Is it one of those things that you watch and just you just watch my silly bobblehead move around for 25 minutes, or do you do it? What you listen to this while you do other things? I'd love to know, just because it's fascinating to me. All right. Thank you for being you. Thanks for being someone who thinks through the scriptures that we uh, that we hear. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope that you have wonderful uh, days of thanks and giving. And uh, I'll see you next time for another first look. So take care.